Hi, I'm John Atak, and I'm extraordinarily happy to welcome Karen de la Carrière again. Uh, hello, Karen. How are you? Hi. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. Hi. And uh, are you going to tell them all to subscribe and send me money? You know, that's that's. <laughs> you know, these shows, this kind of action is done completely voluntary. It's all done. It's it's done from the heart because it has to be voiced and it's a kind of a legacy these days one leaves one's word on video and on youtube mm -hmm. rather than a lonely stone in a cemetery where people just see born died <laughs> a true gentleman they would say of johnny well i hope they would imagine having tons of videos that educate unknown people will never ever meet but they cut they they change their way of thinking because they watch the video mm. that is that is good so john is dedicated to keep going with all of these and what i want to ask you is please subscribe that's the first thing we want you as part of our audience we want you hit the subscribe button and then a little bell will flash on the screen. The bell, if you click it, is notifications. When John does a new presentation, you will be notified. It's not a spam. You're not going to get any kind of offers or anything. You just hit the bell and all you get is John's notifications. Can you please become a patron? Even if it's something like $5 a month, hit the patron button and subscribe so that there is some revenue for John to survive on for all his work. That's the business out of the way. Now let's educate and enlighten you. So. I suggested that, that we might talk about the way that language is used in Scientology. And mm. I think, you know, how many class 12s were actually made? I was told initially there were 24, is that right? You know, as a grand total from 1971, when it was first, mm. there have been 50, a grand total. Mm. <laughs> about 15 of them are dead, 15 or 20 died. 15 or 20, most of them got declared SP. 90% of them got declared suppressive first. Like St. Hill, all the old St. Hill, 95% of old St. Hill ones got. Imagine that you, John, you can't even imagine how brutal the internships are to get to. 10, 11, 12, you burn the midnight oil, you video, video, video. <laughs> You have no day off. You study, you practice. <sighs> Finally, you reach the pinnacle in training, which pinnacle. is what I did. And, but I went further than that. I became a class 12 CS. Yeah. So I managed the class 12s. And of those, to my knowledge, there have only been eight in the whole world wow. that reached that. You might know. Uh, the senior CS FSO, which he, you would know him. He was at St. Hill in the 70s. What's his name? Begins Richard, Richard Reese. Richard Reese. Yeah, yeah who, who was, uh, I believe, was the when um, Bill Clinton said he was at Oxford with his ontologist, it was Richard Reese. Yeah. But he audited me. He was auditing me and Van Morrison. We were his only, because I'd complained about oh, the level of quality. And so in the morning, he'd go and talk to Van Morrison, who of course left shortly yeah. afterwards. And in the afternoon he'd get me. So I don't think he did a very good job, but he, he died a couple of years ago, didn't he? Yeah, he died a few years ago. Cancer, cancer. Yeah, yet again. And another class 12 CS, Alan Kartinsuski, who was the CS of the Lisa McPherson tragedy. He, he even made it to, in fact, I more or less trained him. He died of cancer. Yeah. So out of the eight, we've already accounted for two who died off of cancer. Six to go. 
the, anyway, the point uh, I wanted to make is is that nobody got further in Scientology than you did. You are correct. one of, as you say, eight people who reached the very top of this. So um, extraordinarily well qualified to talk about the subject. Yes, but John, I didn't. I didn't know how to think. No. Doesn't matter what I was thinking. I didn't know how to think because what happens in Scientology is your personal thinking, your personal truths are confiscated mm -hmm. and your truth must only be what the Guru Hubbard says. Mm -hmm. You cannot think beyond it. And Hubbard wrote something about every subject. How window to clean, the bars, how, how to clean windows, yeah. How to do laundry, how to manage your budget, how to think of art, how to have a relationship, how to end a relationship, how to, to write up and report your best friends, rattle, rattle them under the guy's knowledge report. Mm. Every subject you can think of, he wrote about how to sweat out poisons from your body, <laughs> yeah. how to talk to your attached spirits and send them through the volcano experience, Hubbard wrote about it. But once you become an adherent or follower, you cannot have your own truth. You must only have Hubbard's truth. Give me a couple of comments on that, John. Yeah, the Sea Organization contract, the 1,000 million years, that's the American billion, where I come from, a billion's a much longer time than that, it's a million million, but the American one's taken over. A thousand million years, you promise to uphold and forward command intent, at the same time that you've been guaranteed that you will become self-determined. Mm -hmm. so, you know, and that ultimately came to the truth rundown after we were gone, where anything that disagrees with Hubbard, even though it's your own experience, and um, Robert J. Lifton called this ideology over experience, where you sacrifice what you've actually seen and done and say, well, that can't be true because Hubbard says it isn't true. And yeah. anything that disagrees, it, it must be dreadful. When you find one of those hundreds of contradictions that Hubbard brought up over and over again, where he can, you know, he's making a conflictual statement with himself, you then get the technical degrades policy letter, which says everything is true. Everything is to be considered as if it were in present time. You can't say this is older than that. And so you kind of completely stuck in the, the mind of this madman, this guy who could not, uh, he couldn't, he couldn't keep his mind still. He was, you know, all over the place, believing one thing one day. Mm. And the, the idea of language, I, I dragged out this, so I read this George Orwell piece. This is from yeah. mm -hmm. it's from the an appendix to uh, 1984. I'm a huge Orwell fan. I, I read most of his novels as a teenager. And the only mm -hmm. one I don't like is 1984. I think what he tells us there is the most important thing he said. But the way it's written, because he was at the end of his life, he didn't have time to redraft it. So it's not very well written. So I'm going to apologise about that. But I'm not going to apologise about this. When I talked with um, the late Margaret Singer, the Berkeley psychology professor many years ago, we both had come to this conclusion that this is one of the most penetrating statements that, that we'd ever seen. It's just a paragraph. It comes from an appendix called The Principles of Newspeak. So all well. I hope Spike will put it up on the screen, right? Well, so she will be able to, because I've typed it up. I was so, you know, just before we started talking, I thought I'll type it up so that Karen can see it first. Yeah. So, the idea is you've got Ingsoc, which is English socialism, which is the, the party that rules everything in Oceania. And they have invented new speak to get rid of old speak. And it says mm. the purpose of new speak was not only to provide a medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits proper to the devotees of Ingsoc but to make all other modes of thought impossible. It was intended that when new speak had been adopted once and for all and old speak forgotten, 
a heretical thought, that is, a thought diverging from the principles of Ing Sok, should be literally unthinkable. Its vocabulary was so constructed as to give exact and often subtle expression to every meaning that a party member could possibly wish to express, while excluding all other meanings and also the possibility of arriving at them by indirect methods. This was done partly by the invention of new words, but chiefly by stripping such words as remained of unorthodox meanings. To give a single example, the word free still existed in Newspeak, but it could only be used in such statements as this dog is free from lice or this field is free from weeds. It could not be used in its old sense of politically free or intellectually free since political and intellectual freedom no longer existed. Mm. And I can remember rereading that after I left Scientology and sort of going, yes, Scientology is kind of unusual among religions. I don't think it is a religion, but <clears throat> that's a matter of opinion. It has this book, which is nearly 600 pages long. And it has this book, which is nearly 600 pages long. And these are all redefinitions. So to add to that, what Ron Hubbard himself said in a policy letter called um, Propaganda by Redefinition of Words, he said, a long-term propaganda technique used by socialists, communists, and Nazis alike is of interest to PR practitioners. I know of no place it is mentioned in the PR literature, but the data had verbal circulation in intelligence circles and is in constant current use. The trick is, and then in capital letters, words are redefined to mean something else to the advantage of the propagandist. Mm. Mm. And mm. 600 pages plus 600, nearly 1200 pages, all generated by one man. Yeah. That's never how, even Shakespeare did not generate that many new words. Yeah. Um, even though he runs to the hundreds. Do you know that the word factory comes from Shakespeare? It's an abbreviation of the word manufactory. Oh. There you go, very useful knowledge that. Um, so we have words that prevent us, inhibit thinking. And part of that is done by reversing meanings. Um, part of it is done by um, finding completely erroneous meanings. So one of my favorites is the word postulate. It mm. gives you the idea. Now, the traditional English word for postulate is a wish. Mm. And if you approach it from that way, it's like a fairy tale, a fairy story, a silly idea. Mm. You know, we're going to wish for things and they will happen, you know. Um, what he gives us is a self-created truth would be simply the consideration generated by self. So already in language, I'm already baffled by what he's saying here. Why can't he just say what he's talking about? But that would be too simple. The word um, postulate reminded, sorry, am I interrupting you? No, it's fine. Can uh, I give you a little, can I just, just yeah, trigger? Interject. There was a, a, a wonderful couple who tried for 20 years to have a child and they just couldn't, and then finally they had in vitro, in vitro fertilization yeah. and she got pregnant and they were over the moon. And then while she was in the third trimester, she got the news from the hospital that that was not her baby. They had implanted the wrong um, because it's all done in lab in labs, the yeah. sperm needs. and it was somebody else's egg, and somebody else's sperm. So just as she was about to have a baby, it was taken away from her, and she was told it's not your baby. Mm -hmm. And Scientology regis just moved in the with vulture claws and said, "You see." It was your postulate. Yeah. Give us fifty thousand dollars, and we will have you change the postulate. This is some of what Scientology sells. Thousand dollars. You want a baby? Give us money. 
will make you fertile and will make you. <laughs> just the word partial, it just reminded me. Um, they will sell you what you say you want to handle. That's the, that's the essence of it. You know the issue. Find the ruin and tell them that you can solve that ruin. You, you know all that. Yeah, absolutely. One word that is completely reversed is the word freedom, John. In surveys, Scientology just bought a survey, survey to find out what the public, the word freedom came up a lot. So Scientology really bumped this, mm. right? The bridge to total freedom. I think we've discussed this. Yes, the total freedom. More and more trapped, more and more trapped, more and more trapped. So here's the reverse happening of what is promised, mm. right? Trapped. I think giving up your personal truth for any guru is walking into a trap, mm. right? The difference between Scientology and other practices, and other cults is they maliciously retaliate if you speak out about their dirty little secrets. Yep. I mean, there yeah. are other cults and you come and go from them, but Scientology puts up hate, malicious tissues of lies, 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 lies on the internet, on their freedom site. So freedom site, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can't let go of you. Even when you're long gone, they're still connecting with you with their hate sites. They cannot let go and just write it off. They can't. It's something that uh, the dreadful Keith Ranieri's Nexium also did. And, and we can see, I mean, it, he uses words like suppressive and being at cause. And yeah. they do exploration of meaning, which is very much a simplified auditing process from Scientology. But they too ferociously pursued um, opponents. And, and in fact, as the group still persists, even though he's been sentenced to 120 years in prison, they're yeah. still out there. You had the same thing with Om Shinrikyo, the, where you had the sarin poisonings in the um, Tokyo subway. Um, their um, leader, Osahara, was actually executed uh, a couple of years ago. But the group still exists, and it's probably larger than it was when he was there. And they were going out and killing people. They had a heart surgeon who was killing people at the behest of Osahara. So that this malevolence, there are groups historically, but there are very few of them. And Scientology right from the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. certainly as early, early as 1950, Hubbard is already going after people who he considers are his opponents. It's nothing to do with, you know, the whole thing about the Sykes that started in 1950. He, he basically his, uh, the second wife who he didn't have, according to the shrinking world of Aaron Hubbard, mm -hmm. and he had a first wife and a third wife, um, she sued for divorce and she had a psychiatrist do a report on him. And that was the triggering moment for him to go, right, mm -hmm. these psychiatrists there. And as he says of the suppressed person, they generalize. So this one psychiatrist had written a report about him. So anybody who was a psychiatrist, a psychologist or a psychotherapist was now evil. You know, so mm -hmm. he fits his own definition. Um, but he begged for psychiatry in those letters you researched. Yeah, he, in, he, wrote, to, he wrote a letter to the Veterans Administration talking about the balance of mind having gone, and he desperately needed help. And he certainly desperately did need help, but um, I, don't, I don't think anybody could have given it to him because I think his psychiatric condition was so complex mm. that, that he was not able to accept help. Um, there's, I was, you made, reminded me of an Alan Watts statement, um, another spiritual fraud i i feel alan walters alan watts oh watts not, not the fattest man in scientology but mm. um oh, he was huge um, but um alan watts the anglican vicar who took zen buddhism to america he said that whenever you follow a guru you've got to realize that you are letting them pick your pocket and sell you your own watch and i think that's such a beautiful statement about mm. all of these gurus and mm. what they're doing that you know 
you're selling water by the river that that whatever there is to learn you have to become your own guru we're not born that way but but we have to be, grow up you know become adults become mature become parents be, you know become responsible citizens and any of these groups Scientology, Nexium, what you know, Om Shinrikyo, they take over a parental role. And in in Hubbard's sense, I mean, when I talked with Mike Rinder uh, a few months ago, and, and he talked about arriving at the Apollo uh, and realizing that he'd been trafficked, that he'd been sent out to do the flag executive briefing course, and was told, oh no, that's that's changed. Yes. And now you belong to us. And yes. he's what 18 years old yeah. and has no money they've got his passport you're going you know hubbard in 1952 in the philadelphia doctorate course sit and listen to me for six weeks and you've got a doctorate there's an easy way to get a doctorate yeah. uh, it's only 500 dollars as well a bar real bargain 38 people took that course by the way only 38 but on that course he says uh we have ways here of making slaves and then in the early 60s, he writes to Kennedy and says, do you want my to buy my brainwashing techniques? And that contradiction always there. You know, I, I wrote a paper a long time ago called Scientology Religion or Intelligence Agency. And it isn't a religion <laughs> in, in any positive sense of the term, you know. I think what bothers me most as I transitioned out of all of this and tried to reboot my head, I had to really uh, restart it, switch off all the way my motors were thinking and evaluating. Um, I always was a straight A student, so academically I was not stupid. Mm. I wasn't stupid. <laughs> Yet many people say, how did you spoil? what? It wasn't even what I was thinking, John. It was how I was thinking. Yeah. I lost all ability to look for an objective truth or a scientific truth or a truth that could be proven no matter what. Mm. There was no truth that I could hold in my head. Mm. It was only what Hubbard said. And sometimes we wonder, we really wonder how people, even after they declare their speed, run back and do, run back and do um, ADE. And yeah. they, yeah. they, they've been cut off from their family, they've been cast in the wilderness, and they beg to return. There have been people who went to ink base to extract a person incarcerated there. And the person doesn't want to leave. Mm. The indoctrination, this is when you've lost all ability to think. And Hubbard said, you are a sociopath if you want to leave the signal. You're antisocial. You're yeah. a criminal. Yeah. You're SP. <laughs> and you swallowed that. Hmm. I, I mean, I still hear Scientologists using the word blow instead of leave. And they say, I blew Scientology. And you go, well, look that word up. It means, <clears throat> excuse me, having to leave because you have committed transgressions, overt, as they yes. call it. And how is it that Hubbard had to keep moving every few months if this is true? You know, how many yes. times did he? run away the evil being who had to yeah. hide 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 as he put it in his lyrics for the road yeah. to freedom uh, because of yeah. his evil purposes but it becomes a you know and, and people will leave the civil organization having been enslaved for however many years and then they'll it'll be demanded that they pay a free loader bill having worked a 90 hour week for years and taken nothing they'll find themselves paying thousands even tens of thousands of dollars to be back in the good graces of the the group that abused them which hubbard actually did talk about there's a point where he he says that people will um respond to the group that last abused them and and that's why the loyal officers 
are one of the great confusions of Scientology as to whether they were working for Xenu or on the other side, um, because he starts imitating this idea of the loyal officer because it's meant to be, you know, an evil force. And a lot of this, it, it's, you know, I, I had critical thinking abilities when I got to Scientology. I knew my Socrates and how to do that kind of stuff. What I didn't have was an understanding of a very particular aspect of psychology, which is called the feeling of knowing. Um. Noesis is the fancy word for it. William James talked about it at the beginning of the 20th century and said, people believe they know. And, mm. you know, I give the same example. I've been giving it for years. When I was 17, uh, a born again, spent two hours chatting with me and trying to convert me. And I just happened to have reread the Gospels out of amusement because they're quite short and very interesting. A lot of good stuff in them. And uh, but I was not a believer. And after, he was exasperated at the end of two hours and he backed away from me lest I leap on him. Uh, I don't know why he was frightened of me. Uh, nobody needs to be. Um, mm. And he, he looked at me and he said, I, I don't understand the Bible, but I know it's all true. And there was the contradiction. <laughs> I don't know it. I don't understand it, but I know. And that is noesis. That's this sense that this must be true. Yeah. And it drives extreme views of every kind, Nazism, the Bolsheviks, mm. the feeling that this must be true. If you look at the Cultural Revolution, where teenagers were burying their professors alive in China, they were beheading their own parents because Mao had given them this idea that the party, yeah. you know, what Pol Pot would call anchor, was that you had to sacrifice yourself to that. You look at the way that the Christian church over the centuries has had people sacrifice themselves to the wealth of popes and the, some of these despicable, awful people. Um, you know, the six popes of the Renaissance, the period of Michelangelo. And you look at the things they did. You know, instead of Julius II, he was the first pope to lead his army into battle. And you're going, how does that fit in with the Prince of Peace notion? But these dreadful people get others to believe who are sincere and empathetic people. You know, that's for me, having interviewed so many of the people who worked with Hubbard now over the years, such nice people, such decent, caring people who really wanted to change the world. And I long ago came to the opinion that perhaps the worst thing that Scientology and the Moonies and the Krishnas and the way into National and Maranatha, all these dreadful groups, that what they'd done was they'd taken the cream. They, they mm -hmm. hadn't taken the idiots. They'd taken people who not only were bright people, but people who really wanted to change the world. And people, if we'd been in the right place, and now we have somebody, you know, say like Ira Chalef, who is changing the world, you know, whose goodwill has gone out into the world with courageous followership and intelligent disobedience. But so many people were wounded yeah. by Scientology instead of being able to give their gifts to the world, their talents to the world. And, and that's a, it's a terrible shame. But here we are, we're giving something now from what we learned from those wounds, you know? Yeah. Well spoken. <laughs>